If you have your Bibles, open with me to the third psalm. The third psalm. And I titled this message tonight, Written in Fire. Because people think that the Bible, some people think the Bible was just written in a nice, quiet meditation state. But much of our Bible was written during a great crisis, in trouble, great emotion, great stress. And David penned the third psalm during a time of great stress. And so this is why I think we love the Psalms, because we can go to the Psalms and we can see that we're not the only ones to be stressed out. So we see that the third Psalm was written at a time, and it tells us above the Psalm, that the third Psalm is a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So what we have here is Absalom rising up against his father, even to the point that he wanted to kill his own father. Could you imagine having a son that literally wanted to murder you and would murder you to get the position of the king from you? And so David flees for his life. Now, a word of exhortation. The title of the psalm is a part of the scripture itself. It wasn't put in by the King James translators. It wasn't put in by the NIV translation. It's a part of the Hebrew text itself. So the title, um, the Hebrew manuscripts we have, have these titles connected with the third psalm. So it tells us the circumstance in which this psalm was written. So it wasn't written during a quiet time in David's life. It was written during a time when David was literally on the run. And he was running from his own son. So it's the psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. That's, that's a part of scripture itself. The Hebrew scholars will tell us, and Derek Kigner is one of them, the notes reproduced in small print in most of our versions at the head of all but a few of the Psalms, are part of the canonical text of the Hebrew Bible. So keep that in mind. Now, I just want to look briefly at the context in which the third Psalm was written. If you turn with me to 2 Samuel, in chapter 15, and verse 14 through 17, you will see the context in which this psalm was written. 2 Samuel 15, 14 through 17. All of the chapter really describes it, but I'm only going to read these few verses tonight. So David gets wind that Mephibosheth, is, uh, Mephibosheth that his son Absalom has stolen the, the hearts of of the people. And it says, Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out and all his household after him, and the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out and all the people after him, and they, and they halted at the last house. So they were in deep sorrow as they are getting ready to leave here. By all appearance, it would seem as if David had lost the kingdom. But David had not lost the kingdom. He was still God's chosen person. This, in a sense, David was going through this because of his sin with Bathsheba. It all stemmed from that failure with Bathsheba, with the adultery and murder of Bathsheba and Uriah, her husband. Because Nathan said, your sin has been put away, 
But because you've done this, you're going to have trouble in your house. So as David is going through this, he's humbling himself. And in a sense, the Lord is using this as a tool of correction in his life. He's trusting God in the midst of all this as his own son is trying to murder him. So you could imagine the range of emotion that David must be going through at this point. Now, it's a very personal psalm. If we go back to Psalm 3, it's a very personal psalm. It's a personal psalm of lamentation. It's the first psalm of lamentation. So we encounter a godly sorrow in, in the book of Psalms. Godly sorrow is a precious quality. In other words, when we go through stuff, even things that are of our own making, things which we sowed bad seed and we're getting to reap some of that harvest that, of the seed that we sowed. If you remember, there is a principle in the Bible. It's called the, the law of sowing and reaping. Now, the good news is, is that as Christians, we don't get to reap the full harvest. God is merciful, isn't he, in that harvest. That yes, we might sometimes reap some of the devastations of the wicked choices that we have made, but we'll never really reap the brunt of what we deserve. And so godly sorrow and the quality of godly sorrow is, is a quality that produces repentance and change in our life. I like the fact that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance, but the Bible also says godly sorrow brings us to repentance. So, let's read this. It says, Lord, how they have increased to trouble me. Many are, they, many are they who rise up against me. Usually when people go for trouble, they exaggerate. But not David, because this was true. There was more with Absalom than were with him. He literally had thousands of people trying to take away his life. When we look at the troubles of David and we contrast David's troubles with our own troubles, we discover one of the reasons why we've been given the book of Psalms. Because David was put in many corners of great difficulty and when the psalm was written in a moment of great difficulty when we're encountering problems and difficulty we can go to a psalm like psalm 3 and we can find great hope and great comfort because David recorded the very prayer that God heard and delivered him from this crisis he wasn't exaggerating now, what I like about the trouble, about the prayer that David wrote, and it's a song, by the way, is he doesn't start out with his trouble. He starts out with Lord. <laughs> Think about that. Lord. He brings his trouble to the Lord. Lord, how they have increased to trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. You and I have never been through what David has gone through to, su to such a degree. Yet there, there may have been times in your life, there's been times in my life when the third psalm has been very comforting to me because it's felt like, it's felt like uh, everyone is against you. But the Bible says if God is for us, who can be against us? And David got to encounter that reality. Now, Matthew Henry has a great quote here in this passage. Absalom's faction, he says, like a snowball, strangely gathered in its motion. David speaks of it as one amazed, and well he might, that a people 
he had so many ways obliged, should almost generally revolt from him and rebel against him and choose for their head such a silly, giddy young fellow as Absalom was. How slippery and deceitful are the many, and how little fidelity and constancy is to be found among men. When you think the leaders, some of the leaders that human beings choose, it's crazy, isn't it? We look and we think, why on earth are you trying to follow a person <laughs> like that? You know, that person is nuts. Well, the thing about Absalom, if you remember the description of Absalom, it says that Absalom was a very good-looking young man, right? And he had the weird practice that whenever he got his hair cut, he would have someone weigh it in measurement. And uh, the Bible even says, physically speaking, there was no blemish in him from head to toe. So he would be a movie star equivalent. I can't think of someone right now. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he was way better looking than Brad Probably Pitt. Was. Yeah, yeah. Um, very good looking gentleman. Errol Flynn, maybe. He was a better oh, looking go. gentleman, yeah. Uh, who, you know, so he could have played as Robin Hood. But anyway, a good looking fellow. And if you know this, human beings are very often driven by outward appearance, not by the heart. And if there is a lesson to be learned, is don't be governed by our outward appearance, but be moved by faith. God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And that was the lesson with someone like David compared to his brothers as well. But Absalom, um, by trickery, when people would come and see the king, and they had to wait for the king's counsel, he would say, there's no reason why you should wait. He said, come to me. I've got the answers. And uh, he says, if you come to me, then I can solve your problems. And one thing that you will discover about false ministry is they make false claims to be able to solve people's problems. The reality of ministry is very often, you have to walk with people with ongoing issues. You don't have the immediate answer to what someone might be facing, except Jesus, except faith in Him. And one reason why people would follow someone like Absalom is they make false promises that if you were to follow their counsel, then you would have your problem solved. Now, Absalom had never been king. He had never faced what David had to face. But he obviously thought he could be a better king than what David was until he tried to become king himself. And then he realized, this is a lot harder than I thought. And we often see people like that, don't we, who try to be a pastor, for example, and they look at my limited performance, for example, I've had that happen to me, and they say, I could do a better job than he can, and I wouldn't dispute that. But the moment they go and try and do it, they realize, man, this is a lot harder than I thought. And it really is. Now, I'm not just talking about the preaching aspect now. I'm talking about dealing with people on a daily basis and learning when people come with their problems, you take those people's problems to the throne of grace and you don't carry those problems in your own heart. You have to be called. Absalom tried to call himself and he failed. He failed. He wasn't called by God and that was the factor. He might have been better looking than David. He might have had more hair than David. But he wasn't called. And there's the problem. You have to be called. Now, 
The weird thing is, God does call, very often, the weak and the foolish. So don't be surprised at some of the people that God does choose to use. So he gets the glory. Now, as Matthew Henry goes on to say, David had had the hearts of his subjects as much as ever any king had. Think about this. The greatest king before Jesus Christ was David. Even though he messed up, all the other kings were measured by David, weren't they? He was the best. So here's the thought. You can have the best king provided by God and still be dissatisfied and still rebel and still choose a different leader than what God's given. Because we have crazy ideas in our head of what we think, uh, of how we think things should be. So David had had the hearts of his subjects as much as ever any king had. And yet now of a sudden he had lost them. As people must not trust too much to princes, that's the reality. So princes must not build too much upon their interest in the people. Works both ways. Psalm 146 verse 3 tells us this. It says, put not your trust in who? Princes. That's people in authority. That's people in positions of power. Don't put your trust in them. Because they're people. They'll fail you. Don't put your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. That's pretty plain, isn't it? There's, there's only salvation in one person. And that's Jesus Christ. He's it. Now, what David went through... Jesus went through on a far bigger scale, on a much bigger level. I like to put it this way, that very often when David wrote the Psalms and he prophesied of Jesus the Messiah, he was going through experiences and he encountered, basically David encountered the feelings and emotions of Christ very often as he's going through his own personal rejections from the people of God, and he's going through the sufferings that everyone will go through who follows Jesus. Let's not forget that Paul, writing to Timothy, some people don't think this is in the Bible by the way they sometimes talk, but it says, Yea, all who live, in God, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's the reality. It's going to happen. There's no salvation in human beings. Now it says about Jesus here in John chapter 2, verse 24, 25. This was a season in Jesus' life when everyone was believing in him, putting their trust in him. This was a popular time in Jesus' ministry because they saw the signs and the wonders. But Jesus knew that that believing in him was merely superficial in many cases. It wasn't real. It wasn't lasting. It wasn't going to last. And so it says here, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. Have you noticed that when uh, his disciples were scattered, when he was struck, Jesus wasn't surprised? Sometimes when I talk to certain people at times in the body of Christ, they're disappointed in other believers because they expect more out of other believers. And I try to tell I, I try to tell these people, I try and tell them, you know, don't don't expect to find, you know, 
absolute faithfulness in, in other human beings. It's not always going to happen. Look to God and don't be too disappointed and too devastated when sometimes the people of God fail to act like the people of God. It just happens. It's part of our fallen sinful nature. And if we're not careful, if our focus is on people, then subtly we might be getting into a subtle form of self-righteousness. Because if I can look at the people of God and say, these people are not doing what they should be doing, then that may give me credence to do what I don't need to do as well. We need to focus on Christ. Focus on Jesus. And keep our focus on Him. Because people will fail us. And that's just because they are sinners. Fallen human beings. Even as Christians, we're not perfect. So don't be shocked when sometimes even God's people don't always do what we're supposed to do. Sometimes I meet people who think when they go through problems that we should be able to read their mind and find out. It's like, wow, how come you don't know that I'm going through this problem? Well, I don't know unless you call me because I can't read minds and I don't operate in weird supernatural words of knowledge. Sometimes God will place people on your heart to pray for, but you don't know why, and you just pray for them. But, you know, we need to be reasonable here about some of these issues that we all walk through. Now, we go back to the third psalm here. And this was the one that really stabbed him. And if we're honest, this is the one that we fear the most. This is the one we're most afraid of. David had people all around him reminding him of his sin, reminding him of his failure. It's believed, and I believe it can be also substantiated from the Bible, that David's chief counselor, Ahithophel, who rebelled against David, was, at, was actually Bathsheba's uncle. So there was something going on there. Now again, if I got that little detail wrong, don't hold it against me. But I'm pretty sure that that's pretty accurate, what I just shared with you. But obviously, there were people who could find reason to move away from David if they were focused on David. <laughs> David had failed. David had sinned. His sin was out in broad daylight. So it shouldn't surprise us if people were saying this about David. David was saying, Many are they who say of me, There is no help for him in God. And that word sealer is a very precious word. Let me tell you why. Because in the third psalm, if you have a Bible that has dropped the sealers, get a Bible that has them. Just saying. Hopefully, you don't have a Bible that's dropped the sealers because that was a part of the original text. Sealer is believed to be a musical interlude where it's pause, meditate, think on this, and I believe it fits perfectly with how the third psalm was written. Wherever you see the sealers, there's a change of thought. There's a change of flow in the psalm. But this was a critical moment. And I believe there was a silence here. Because David realized if God was to treat him according to what he deserved, then maybe his enemies were right. And what was going on in his life, it may have had the appearance as if God had abandoned him. Here's a thought. God disciplines those he loves, but he will never abandon those he loves. God disciplines those he loves, but he will never pour out his wrath on those he loves. He'll take us to the woodshed at times. 
when we need it. But according to the Bible, discipline, when he disciplines and chastens us, isn't that a sign that he loves us? That we're not illegitimate children if he corrects and chastens us. And you may rest assured, David was loved by God. How do we know? God would chasten him. So David is facing his deepest fear. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Selah, a break. This was his deepest fear. If we're honest, this can be the deepest fear of the believer. As you remember your sins, you remember your failures, and you're bringing them to your mind, there can be a fear very often that God has given you up. But he didn't give David up. And he will never give up a child of God. Right. I, th I think the NASB says it really well. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance or salvation for him in God. Amen. So it's more than just a physical. It's, it's more than just an outward health. Yeah. It's more of a... It's, it's almost like a... It doesn't relate to the inner parts. It, yeah. it almost seems like a physical outward health. But he's, he's saying here that this is my soul. Yeah. They're saying that, that I'm doomed, I'm condemned by God. He's, he's being given over. Yeah. If you remember, what added to this is as, as he's leaving, there was a man by the name of Shemaiah, who was a Benjaminite. And he wasn't English, but he would say, Go on up, you bloody man, you know. And that's the King James Version. <laughs> Um, go on up, you man of blood. And he even said, God is repaying you for the evil that you did to the house of Saul. Now, obviously, David was being slandered falsely because he treated Saul very well, actually. But there were rumors circulating around about David that he was responsible for Saul's death. In other words, he was being accused of that, and of course Uriah and the Bathsheba incident also. Now, obviously, they were David's, one of David's men, Abishai, was not shy about wanting to take his head off. And David says, no, leave him alone, because the Lord has permitted him to curse me out. Now, what, what David did, he entrusted his soul to God. And he gave it over to God and he said, perhaps God will look upon what I'm going through today and he'll have mercy on me. And Shemaiah kicked up dust, if you remember, picked up rocks and was throwing rocks at them and telling them, get out of here, you know. And Shemaiah was convinced there's no way that this man is coming back from this. He's done. He's toast. But what he forgot was, David was a man of God. <laughs> and a man of God belongs to God, and God can always bring that man or woman back up again, against all the odds. And that's what happened to David. By all appearance, it would appear that David had lost the throne, but not really. Not really, just temporarily. He was still king. When we face our fears like David did here of perhaps losing our salvation, when we face a potential possibility of lo losing our salvation, and we bring our salvation to God, it's like Luther said, he said, when I look at myself, I don't see how I could possibly be saved. But he said, when I look to Jesus, I don't see possibly how I could lose my salvation. Amen. So it depends on your focus. Is it you or is it Christ? Go ahead. The parallel between what David is saying here is, is exactly what Christ was experiencing while being persecuted by the Sanhedrin and Pontius Pilate and 
many were probably saying, he's lost. He has no... We put our hope in him. I'm laughing because you're reading my notes. Because oh. <laughs> we're, we're actually going to go there. But it's good we're on the right track. Yeah, they're just, you know, they were laughing and yeah. talking and saying, who is this man, you know? He can't save us. Yeah, one of the... One of the weird things about some of the typologies of, uh, of the Old Testament is the, the sufferings of some of these men and women. You think of David, you think of Joseph. They're actually a picture of Christ, whether they want to be a picture of Christ or not. It's almost like they're partaking in the fellowship of Christ's sufferings because Christ is very sweet to them in the midst of this. And when you look at David, he's, he's a type of the one that was to come. Because let's not forget, it was actually David who penned the words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But it was Jesus who uttered those words on the cross. So there's a definite connection with David's emotional experience and reality. And as he's writing down the words, there's a definite connection between him and Christ, the son of David, Jesus Christ, in many of the things that he wrote. And I think the third psalm is one of those issues again. In fact, what it tells us is that David trod the same region, Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, as he's leaving Jerusalem in tears, Jesus is going into Gethsemane with great sorrow, getting ready to face the ultimate test of drinking the cup of God's wrath for you and me. So sorrow is a, it is a portion of the, of the life of a believer. Like it or not, sorrow is a part of our Christian life. Not heaven, but right here below. Spurgeon has a note on this. David complains before his loving God of the worst weapon of his enemies' attacks and the bitterest drop of his distresses. Oh, saith David, many there be that say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. My friends, if there is no help for us in God, where can we get help? If God turns off his help to us, where could we go? Where could we get it? This was the stinger. This was the, this was the test that David was going through. Now, oh, he... Okay. So, sorry, go ahead. With Absalom, you know, going after David, here's his own son. So how, how did that appear to the other people as well, that his own son was trying to kill him and take over? But I, I also see another correlation, too, with Absalom wasn't, um, wasn't godly because of, his lineage was the same as David's, right? Yeah. And, and yet he was still an evil man. So I, th I think that also shows that uh, your lineage doesn't save you as well, right? That's right. I think it's another, just a couple thoughts that I had about Absalom. Um, yeah. You know, and yeah, outwardly speaking, he really looked the part. He's yeah. a very prideful person because he, he would run chariots in front of him. And uh, his brother did that too after he died. It, it seemed to be a big problem. Um. Yet David knew in his own conscience that he had given them some ground for this exclamation. For he had committed sin against God in the very light of day. Then they flung his crying with Bathsheba into his face. And they said, Go up, thou bloody man. God hath forsaken thee and left thee. Now, when we focus on our failures as believers or we focus on our sins, there is a temptation that perhaps God might have forsaken us. 
And sometimes we mistake the Lord's correction for the Lord's rejection. The Lord's correction isn't the Lord's rejection. Thank God. In fact, the Lord's correction is a sign that you're His. But this is the deepest trial that any believer goes through is the temptation and the thought that God has abandoned you. You know, when we look at our sin and we look at our failures, like David in Psalm 3, the temptation is, God, have you left me? Have you abandoned me? But David would learn, as we often learn, the Lord's correction is not the Lord's rejection. That's good news, isn't it? Hallelujah. Now, Spurgeon goes on to say about the third psalm here, and them saying, you know, there is no help for him in God. Thank God that that's not true tonight. Amen? There's always help for us in God if we go there. He says, if all the trials which come from heaven, all the temptations which ascend from hell, and all the crosses which arise from earth could be mixed and pressed together, they would not make a trial so terrible as that which is contained in this verse. Many a day you say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. It is the most bitter of all afflictions to be led to fear that there is no help for us in God. Now here's a thought. They said the same about Jesus. We, we're on the same page. They said the same about Jesus. If you turn with me to Matthew 27 and verse 43. Now here's a thought though. All, all of the sin was put on Jesus. Jesus was identified with my sin. And your sin, and whereby I should have been punished, Jesus was punished in my place. God did temporarily reject his only son. Only temporarily. But he eternally received him when he raised him from the dead. So here, Matthew 27, verse 43... <laughs> He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. So in other words, Jesus blasphemed. He claimed to be God. He claimed equality with God himself. Now think about this. If you are going by a visual... And you were seeing Jesus dying the worst death imaginable on the cross. He's stripped naked, he's beaten, he's bruised, and he's going for the worst death imaginable. Wouldn't you be tempted to think that God had forsook him as well? Perhaps we might join in this chorus and say, well, I thought he was the son of God. In fact, this could be why he's being punished. Because in his own words, he must have spoken blasphemy. Oh, but there's, there's a, how can you put it? There's a paradox here going on, a, an, an apparent contradiction going on here. Here's a thought. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. In other words, even though Jesus never had any sin, even as he's on the cross, he's still perfect, he's still, he's, he's still spotless, he's still sinless, he is dealt with as if he is a sinner. He is punished in your place. He is punished in my place. That was as if I was being punished on that cross. Every sin that I committed was being punished on that cross. I, the sinner, was being punished on that cross. But Christ, our substitutionary sacrifice, was being punished in our place. Isn't that wonderful to consider? So our, our God is good. Our God is very good. Now, turn with me to Isaiah 53. 
Isaiah and the 53rd chapter. This is the paradox. Because how the people saw it and how God the Father viewed the reality of it were two different things. It says here that surely he has borne our griefs. Think about this. David in Psalm 3 is sharing his griefs with the Lord, is he not? David could say that the Lord has bore his griefs that he wrote down in Psalm 3. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Here's a thought. Even before the cross happened, it was already revealed what the true meaning of the cross was all about. Here, here's the crunch. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Well, here's the crunch. Jesus was stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but not in the way the people were thinking. He was stricken, smitten by God and afflicted because he was being identified with me. As Jesus was stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God, God, in a sense, was really afflicting me in Christ. I was being dealt with in Christ. God's justice. Now, notice this next part. It says, uh, but he was pierced for, for what? For our transgressions. That's good news. Because yes, I deserve punishment for my sin. Yes, I deserve God to condemn me. But the only reason why God doesn't condemn me, although he does discipline me, is because Christ was condemned in my place. That's the only reason. That's the greatest deliverance. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the, what? Chastisement? What's another word for chastisement? When you chastise somebody, what are you doing? You are punishing them, right? Right? Punishment. Chastisement is punishment. The punishment that brought us peace upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. Here's a thought. If Christ, if the punishment that should have been mine was placed on Christ, then doesn't that mean that Christ isn't going to punish me? He disciplines. He corrects. But he doesn't condemn the believer because Christ was condemned in the believer's place. So let's not mistake the Lord's correction for his rejection because Christ was rejected in your place and that was only temporary. And Christ is not going to reject you again because of Christ's temporary rejection for you. It covered it. It took care of it. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. The punishment. And with his wounds, we are healed. Now, I've got to go to Galatians 3.13 here because Galatians 3.13 clearly tells us that not only did Christ take the curse of the law, but he also became a curse for us. He became a curse for us. For he, God the Father, 2 Corinthians 5.21, has made him, Jesus who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
His perfect righteousness is bestowed upon us because all of our sin was placed upon him. Without our sin being placed upon him first, there is no way that the righteousness of God could be given to us. It's impossible. But Galatians 3, 13. What did the cross accomplish for you and me? Isn't it tragic when Christians negate the cross? When we look at the cross like it's not a finished work? When we look at the cross like it's not paid in full? It, it really has been paid in full. In Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he do it? Having become a curse for us. He literally became a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Isn't that why we're saved tonight? Because of what he did for us? If this isn't enough, then nothing will be. If righteousness would come by, by us, by the law, then Christ died in vain for no reason. Now we go back to the third psalm here, and we hit the third verse, and notice the change. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. There was a sealer, pause, think on it. And as he thinks on it and he faces that fear, he has a great response to the reality. He says, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. Now the literal rendering is better. Does anyone have a translation out there that says a shield around me? Around me. That's the literal rendering. About me. Is About me. Around me. This is covering a big shield that protects you and covers you. And what David is saying is, I'm protected by God. You are my shield. Around me, I trust in you. Never has anyone trusted in God and God has failed them. He says, my glory and the one who lifts up my head or the lifter of my head. When they left Jerusalem, their heads were down. They were in deep sorrow. But as he puts his trust in God, God lifts up his head. Here's a thought. When I put, when I put my faith in God, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks anymore <laughs> because it's God. It's me and God, you know. Other people cast David off. Other people even cast Jesus off. But it doesn't matter because we've put our trust in God and he will bring us up again. There is a psalm of David that says, Though the righteous man falls seven times, the Lord will bring him up again. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. Answered prayer is a beautiful thing. God doesn't answer our prayer because we, we sound beautiful very often when we pray. A cry doesn't sound pretty if we're honest. But David says, I cried to the Lord with my voice. Trouble and problems like what David was going through here, having his own son trying to murder him, losing his throne temporarily, that produces real prayer. Now, there's many forms of prayer. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that we're not praying if, we're, if everything is great. I prefer those quiet prayers, don't you? I'd rather have the quiet moments and quiet moments of meditation where everything is sweet. However, when we go through problems like this, our prayers often become more urgent in scope, urgent in nature, and more emergency pressed. And David says, and he heard me from his holy hill. And here's that sealer again. 
change, a transition about to happen again. We don't know how it works, if we're honest, but we know when we've prayed, sometimes there's that sense that you know that God has heard you. Have you ever had that where you just have that sense that God's heard you? Now, when you don't have that sense, take him at his promise, take him at his word. But it's nice sometimes as human beings to just have that extra sense that when you've prayed, God has heard you. It's like a lifting of the weight off of you where you have actually had a full release from your problems. You've rolled off all of your burdens under the Lord and he is sustaining you. You have cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And there's nothing like it on planet Earth. It's a beautiful thing to be going through problems and know that you're not going through those problems alone and know that God has heard your prayer on behalf of a loved one or maybe your own personal issues as well. Now, here's a, here's a sleep of faith. David, you've got thousands of people trying to kill you. They're hunting you down like a fox. You're the fox and they're the hunters. What are you going to do? Well, David, Psalm 3 verse 5, notice this. He says, I lay down and slept. Amen. <laughs> and that's not a sleep of presumption. The sleep of faith is the best sleep there is. I lay down and slept. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord watches the city, the watchmen watch it in vain. And then one of the ones that I've received correction from, in vain, you rise up early and stay up late. I still stay up late. But eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives his beloved sleep, right? And I remember one night I was going through something in the church. This was a long time ago. And I was worried. I was stressed. And that verse came to me. So I just went to bed. Very often the troubles we go through, if we can sleep on those troubles, they're a lot different in the morning, aren't they? Because very often when we're overwhelmed with trouble, we're usually tired as well. I have I found that when I'm tired and when I'm really wore out, I, I get more negative, don't you? I get more negative in my thinking. And sometimes the best thing we can do when we're going through problems is, I'm going to sleep on it. I'll deal with it in the morning. And very often when you get up, you have a whole new perspective on the issue than you had the night before. But here's a thought. Roll it off on the Lord, because there is a warning in Scripture. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. If you go to sleep angry, you're not going to sleep very well. That'll be when you get those weird zombie dreams and all that kind of stuff. That'll be when you get those weird end-timed dreams where maybe the rapture happened and you're the one that got left behind, you know? Or you're actually, you're actually in, in a Mad Max movie, you know, where you're actually attacking people. I know you've had those weird dreams, John. So don't let the sun go down on your anger. Uh, be angry and sin not. And we all have that battle sometimes. And it's like you've been eating Mexican food in your soul. You know, everything is hot when you, and you don't sleep as well as you ought. Um, I lay down and slept. Here's a thought. When we trust ourselves to the sovereignty of God, we hit a point where people start thinking you're crazy. Because you've hit that point now where you're saying, if the worst fear happens to me, it must be from the Lord. So you hit that point where you begin to trust in the Lord's activity so much that you realize nothing can touch you without the Lord's permission. That's a beautiful place to be. 
And in other words, you realize nothing can penetrate my life unless the Lord wills it and permits it. And if the Lord permits it, it must be for my ultimate good. Go ahead. There's a profound thought here in the Hebrew, I laid me down and slept means sleep. That's it. He yes. just went to sleep, just completely relaxed, completely put it in God's hands. What a profound thought. I mean, it's just like, why am I going to carry this and worry about it? I'm just going to give it to God. Yeah, amen. I think there comes a point when you realize it's bigger than us. It's too big for us. Where we've tried all of our, all of our strength, all of our wisdom, all of our reasoning, all of our effort, and you just wore out. You're like, no, nope, that ain't going to change it. And you go to sleep. There's another instance where this happened. If you remember Peter. Peter is asleep in jail. And, he, and he's going to lose his head the next morning. And, and there he is asleep. And he, he's in such a sleep that when the angel does show up and breaks the chains, Peter himself thinks he's dreaming <laughs> as he's going out of the jail. Now here's another thought. Rhoda, the young lady that was praying with the other apostles, when Peter knocks at the door... She semi-opens part of the door and doesn't open this, the final door, slams the door in his face and runs and says, you know, Peter's at the door. You think she would have let him in. That's what I'm saying. And what did they say? And I don't understand this, but they said, no, it's Peter's ghost. It's Peter's spirit. They probably already killed him. Here they are praying for his release. The Lord answers the prayer and they really don't believe it. But Peter stood right there, and they finally let him in. <laughs> Which again shows us that God is not limited by our lack of faith even. You know, um, he's not going to be mastered by human beings. <laughs> he's bigger than us. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. So he's got new strength, new energy. And now he's ready to face the battle. Now he's not exaggerating here. In Psalm 3 verse 6. We look at David and we say, you know, I've got problems. But I don't have thousands of people who are trying to murder me. I don't have that. But David is able to say, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. You are a shield around me. I put my trust in you. The only thing that you and I can do is to put our faith in Jesus Christ, to trust in God. And as we trust in him, we will truly find the peace that that faith in God brings. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's an alternate rendering in the Greek which potentially there are some manuscripts that says, let us have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith and peace go hand in hand. Now, he goes on to say, we're almost done here. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Now, here's a thought. There would be battles that David would have to do. He had an army as well. And there would be a battle ensuing. David's confidence is not in his troops. It's not in his own wisdom or experience because he's had these fights before. He's trusting in the Lord. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. And even before it's finished, he says, For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. In other words... You have shattered their teeth. They can't hurt me anymore because you're fighting on my behalf. Now, if we think that salvation is anywhere else but the Lord, even if we think salvation is in ourselves, 
we're going to be looking in the wrong places. We have to hit that spot where we realize that salvation is in him and in him alone. Before I read this, turn with me to Acts 4.12. Acts 4.12, very well-known passage, but let's tie it in here with this very verse. Just so you give up on trying to find salvation anyplace else except Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 tells us, here's a weird thought. Uh, A lot of professing believers, or even believers sometimes, instead of looking for salvation in Christ, we look for salvation in ourselves, And that's a big mistake. And you'll never be resolved there. You won't find peace there because there'll always be something that's not finished in you. Um, but when you look at Christ, when he said it is finished, he meant what he said. It is finished. Are we trusting tonight? in the finished work of Christ, or are we trusting in our own imperfect development in Christ? Or our own ability to keep it, too. Amen. Amen. Pastor, just the fact that over the course of my lifetime as a Christian, I've come across so many that have told me, I hope I've been good enough, or I hope... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Who are making the statement they hope they've been good enough. Yeah. And they're relying on themselves. Yeah, they're relying, they're totally relying on themselves yeah. when they say that. Yeah. The sad thing about that is, especially if they've gone to church, it's like, are they hearing the gospel? They don't realize they're not good enough. I mean, I think that's key yeah. there. They're looking in the wrong place. Yep. <coughs> You'll never be good enough to be saved. That's the point. Amen. Acts 4, well, I'll read verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. So the builders were the religious people who had rejected it. They're building, but they're not building with the right stone. They're not putting their trust in Christ. Nor is there salvation in any other, in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation is not in you, it's not in me, it's in Christ and Christ alone. And no matter how long I've been a Christian, that doesn't change. Still in Christ alone. It doesn't reach that point where, okay, you've been a Christian now for 30 plus years. Guess what, Brian? You've got some salvation in you now. Oh, no. No, it's always Christ alone. Always Christ alone. Are we growing in this salvation? Yeah, but Christ is the source of this salvation. He's our trust. It's by faith and faith alone. When does it quit being by faith alone? When you see him face to face. Yeah, but it'll still be his salvation. Yeah, it's just that faith will be, you know, done away with because you won't, you'll you'll be seeing him. Faith and hope will be gone and love will remain. Now, so the final verse here, guys. Uh, Salvation belongs to who? The Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. If it belongs to the Lord, then he's able to keep it. And if you entrust yourself to him, he's going to keep it. Belongs to him. Your blessing is upon your people. And notice he closes it again with a selah. I believe this was probably the musical interlude of his, of his song. David would often get songs, not when he's in a quiet spot, but when he's in a corner. God would give him songs. Psalm 3 has been a great blessing for many believers over the centuries. I'm sure as we've read through it, you've thought about some of the songs that have been based on the third psalm. What a blessing Psalm 3 has been for us. All because of what David went through. We can look at Psalm 3 and say, you know, I'm going through stuff as well. 
But here we have a clear, a clear path through our trouble, written by a man who was in deep trouble, so that we could look at it in our trouble and say, the God of David can help me as well, because he's my God too. Amen? Amen. Well, with that, guys, we'll close, but any thoughts, got a, any questions? I've got a note in my study Bible. It says, this is, this is a broad-sweeping, all-inclusive deliverance, whether in the temporal or eternal realm. Yeah, both aspects. Yeah. God is concerned about our temporal, but he's far more concerned about our eternal aspect. Uh, because if people did kill David, they couldn't eliminate his hope in God. They couldn't separate him from God. Yeah. They couldn't destroy his soul. But God had a plan for David. It wasn't his time yet to leave planet Earth. And he wasn't going to leave by being murdered by his son. Um, God, God had different intentions for him. Um, his work wasn't completed yet. So, our God is good tonight, isn't he? He's Amen. a good God. Well, shall we, uh, shall we close in prayer then? Uh, John, would you close in prayer? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.